I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. And today we are finishing our journey through Middle Earth as we are talking about The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, the 2003 film directed by Peter Jackson, screenplay by Fran Walsh, Philip Boyens, and Peter Jackson based on the novel by J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Arand. Hello, everybody. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Calleros. Hi. So here we are at the end <sighs> of Lord of the Rings. We are approaching Mount Doom, but there is still more podcasting for us to do because our episode on The Hobbit will be available to the patrons today. That's the, the other chapter uh-huh. that goes through Middle <laughs> Earth, which is a thing that we, we talked about and we have thoughts on. So for patrons... That is a patron exclusive available to you. So check that out on Patreon. We are cramming all of our thoughts on all three of the Hobbit films into one delicious podcast for you. Yes. <laughs> Just like should have been done with the story. <laughs> oh, you might say. That's true. A little taste there. <laughs> yes. And because Lord of the Rings was our, our reward for passing 500 patrons, we wanted to take this opportunity to announce our next Patreon goal, which is that when we pass 750 patrons on the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon, we will do a three-part series on the Indiana Jones trilogy. Yay! With a bonus <laughs> patron exclusive episode on, of course, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. You're seeing a trend. Kingdom here. of the Crystal Skull. Right? Kingdom. Yeah. There's there's more words Whatever. in the title than you think there are. <laughs> Get it right. Even when you think you've gotten it, you missed like something. <laughs> you want to be saying the words for as little time as possible. So I... The nuclear refrigerator movie. <laughs> yes. I'm seeing a trend with our public mm-hmm. episodes and patron exclusives. I, I like it. Well, it's only it's only over on Patreon that we can really let our hair down and be, right. <laughs> be free to say what we really think. <laughs> Indeed. Speaking of hair down, there's lots of characters with long hair in Return of the King. <laughs> wow. Uh, what a smooth transition. I mean, Denethor's got some long, greasy hair. Oh, he went for Denethor's hair first? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I feel like his hair bothers me the most. So that's where my um, mind is. Aragorn runs. gets a straightener out at the end of the movie. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. A lot of hair transformation happens in this episode. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious for you guys. We talked in our fellowship episode about going in to see the fellowship for the first time, what that was like. Return of the King, you know, was two years later that had all this hype. People had seen the first two episodes. So uh, I'm calling them episodes. It feels weird to call the Lord of the Rings episodes, but yeah, I mean, it's an episodic trilogy, I guess. Uh, Yeah. 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 I want to know from you guys after seeing the fellowship and the two towers going into the return of the king what were your expectations how were you feeling brian let's start with you yeah I, it's funny because i don't know i can't remember with two towers of return of the king what my expectations were or like whether i was disappointed it just sort of felt like once lord of the rings was part of my life then then it was so i even if there was stuff in the movies i didn't like 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 a less bouncing around it was like okay but this is like part of these movies that I love. So I love all of it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember having any strong, oh, I expected this and I didn't get it. And, you know, that kind of thing. What I do remember is I was in college and me and a good 10 friends or so uh, went and saw it at the theater together. Uh, And that was, yeah, that was really fun. And then my three roommates and I, we you know, like hobbits at the end, when they get back home, we just like sat in our kitchen until dawn and just talked about the movie. That's so cute. And I don't even remember what we said. I just remember that it was like we had this adrenaline of we had just come back from Return of the King and we just wanted to sit and hang out and talk and and everything. So loved the movie, loved the awards that it won, loved the stuff in the extended, which we can get into, even if the extended is probably longer than a movie should be. (laughs) Still (laughs) like the stuff that's probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Cool. And Trisha, what about you? I mean, I don't have a strong memory of seeing this in the theater. I'm sure I did. You know, my, as we talked about, especially in the first uh, episode of our little series here, when we were talking about fellowship, my experience with these was, you know, very much like intellectually, I understand that these are good movies, but they are not special to me. And, you know, at the time, were not in any way special to me. And I was just kind of like, yeah, good, big fantasy epic. People like this. 
Sure. <laughs> and I, I mostly remember just the year. I mostly just remember being immersed in the critical response and in the audience response to it and just how it was, you know, such a phenomenon at the time. I think that everybody was shocked and impressed and like, you know, the worst thing that you can say about Return of the King is that it ends too many times. Mm. But but mostly it's just like they landed it, you know, with perfect tens in in an incredible way that I don't think there was a lot of precedent for. And everybody was just like, you know, home run. Yes. Um, from critics almost universally, from audiences for sure. And then of course, I'm a massive fan of the Academy Awards. I love to watch them every year and have watched them every year, you know, basically for as long as I can remember. And I just remember the sweep, which was incredible that, you know, night that we were watching where they won. Um, I think the number is 11. I have it written it's down. 11 yeah. 11 out of 14 yeah, just, or something? No, it was every one that it was nominated really? for. Really? Okay. It was nominated for 11 and it won 11. So That's it's crazy. a clean sweep and it's still the most, it's tied, but it's the most Academy Awards won by a single film and all the ones it was nominated for. And I just remember watching on, on awards night and going like, just being, you know, swept off my feet by the achievement that was being celebrated universally. Like, I can't remember the last time that a movie that won at the Oscars that many awards was so, like, I, who's out here critiquing it? Nobody, nobody, mm -hmm. you know? It's the technical achievement and the narrative achievement was just so towering that no one had a bad word to say about it. Yeah, for sure. And Alex, what was it like for you? <laughs> <laughs> so you're asking that very pointedly uh, because, yeah, I think it's already obvious maybe from my previous talking about these movies in the last two episodes that I was a super fan by this point. I had read the books and I loved the first two films. And so my hype going into film three was just like you know, off the yeah. charts, like through the roof, like day one, I'm going in and seeing it like first showing. It was one of my more like transcendent film experiences in a theater because I a lot of my favorite moments from the books are in the third book a lot of just like the the finale on Mount Doom with Frodo and Sam and how far you know the book pushes mm -hmm. it where it really it just seems like this is impossible this is desperate you know in the books Frodo does not throw the ring in he puts the ring on like that's all in the book and it's like when you've gone through this epic journey and gotten to this climax I mean that was where I was so riveted with every word on the page it's like what is gonna happen oh, they're, <laughs> they're doing this oh, holy crap and so i was waiting for these pivotal moments in the movies and then to see the movies nail those moments like as better than i imagined and the music and the visual effects and the ending at the gray havens making me cry and all of it just like you said like a perfect landing of this epic journey was just like the highlight of my like theater going experience to that point in my life like i just i walked <laughs> out of the theater feeling like they did it they just they did it 100 percent. so i you know i had a great time and i saw it many times in theaters and for the longest time i think because of how special that theater experience was for me it it was my favorite of the movies because it just was tied to that emotional experience mm -hmm. I, now when i think about the film's I've I've gone and seen them actually in marathon form because you know LA back when we had movie theaters and went to movie theaters. RIP. <laughs> about, about once a year, you know, the American Cinematheque or ArcLight Theaters or something in LA would would put on a all-day marathon of all three movies. Often it would be the first two films extended editions and Return of the King theatrical just because it was too much to do that extended yeah. as well. And seeing the movies that way You'd think that that's just like, don't even do it's too much for a day. But when you're in a movie theater full of fellow fans and you have breaks to go get meals between the, the movies and you come back in and everybody's cheering and they're they're with all these special moments. It's actually a wonderful experience. And it's really cool to have the journey from Shire and then back to Shire again at the end, like all in one just day. And and so now when I think about the films, I don't really break them up into like, oh, this one's the best one. Or this one's the best one. It really does feel like one big journey. And all of the films have parts that I really don't like. And all of them have parts that I absolutely love. Return of the King, I think, has 
some of my least favorite moments and some of my favorite moments of the whole trilogy. So it's interesting in that way. It's got some of my highest highs and lowest lows. We can get into those. But yeah, overall, my hype was through the roof and it delivered. And I just was so happy. <laughs> I feel like the entire time I've known you, I feel like once a year, like we talk about how mind blowing that experience was for you. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was one of those. It, it was kind of there's some of those moments where you realize like how special movies are to you. And I think yeah, when I had that experience, it was it was like wow, like this director, this team, these people, like were able to give me this all this, you know, which is like so, so <laughs> special. It's like, wow, like that's possible to to give this to the world, like this amazing three year journey and all these emotions at the end. Like what else can do this? Nothing like movies can do this. How cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just what's so crazy impressive, as you're saying about this, this whole trilogy of films and that it happened and it does kind of seem miraculous, like something that could not be repeated. Um, <laughs> Correct, <laughs> but in the, that way that like all things that are I think truly special mm. are like when right. the, the pinnacle of specialness is this thing that can kind of only exist this one time and in this one moment and film does let us occasionally capture those things and and create them as these things that we can take with us and watch over and over again and and remember those experiences how these movies even came to be is like kind of a like, how how does this happen? It's kind of a crazy <laughs> segue to Brian. <laughs> well, I was going to say, and I feel like the narrative of how the movies got made was public enough, right? Like, it was definitely a part of the conversation around why these movies are so good. Like, it right. wasn't just... You know, so often so much of the production process or like the the story, if you will, of like where a movie, the inception of like where a movie actually started and then, bef you know, it arrives on your screen. So much of that is typically shrouded from us. And yet with Lord of the Rings, and I think a big part of it because of the DVD sets that we've talked about before, but like right. even at the time, even when it was in theaters, I remember there being very open stories and conversations about this was the journey. And so I think, you know, it has that sort of meta satisfaction to it of like, this was a daunting journey for the mm -hmm. filmmakers, as well as, you know, this long epic quest narrative that we send the characters on. There's this mirroring that's going on in the, the narratives of both of these things that is really moving no matter who you are, like no matter how you feel about the finished product, the, the labor of love is really moving. Yeah, I mean, the journey to make these movies is longer than the journey that the characters go on during the course of, right. of the movies. Yeah, it was as far back as 95 when Peter Jackson was doing the Frighteners and he and Fran Walsh wanted to do like an epic fantasy and they just kept thinking Tolkien. And eventually he was like, well, what if we just did Tolkien? Like who has the rights to that? And they started trying to figure that out and, and pitch it and everything. And they were trying to get it made. So they were saying, well, what if we did a Hobbit movie and then two Lord of the Rings movies? Or what if we just did like, Maybe we could do two Lord of the Rings movies. We could do one if we had to. And New Line said, eventually it got to New Line and New Line said, you can't do two. This is three. And they're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, you know, just worried they're going to be like, you can make one Lord of the Rings movies, pal. And, uh, and, and yeah, so then they started, you know, this epic task of just taking this, this basically one book, like Tolkien wrote one book and right. he hated that it had to be split up, you know? So I do appreciate that mm. the movies are presented as the Lord of the Rings. And then five, 10 minutes in, the Fellowship of the Ring, like this week on The Lord of the Rings, the movie, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. yep. and which does it does give it this nice episodic feel. And like you said, Alex, I don't if you ask me which one's my favorite, like, I don't care. That's not an interesting question to me. It's like it's just a, it's one experience in three parts, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, so then they started working at it uh, with, you know, it's Peter and, and Fran Walsh, like the, the, his partner. And people just talk about them saying she's so good at putting words on paper and then he's so good at putting the words onto the screen, which is just a cool way to think about their their partnership. Then eventually when they, they had basically written an entire treatment for two films. So then when they realized they were going to get to make three, then they had to decide how to do that, which they were still doing in, you know, post-production on <laughs> Two yep. Towers. But then that's when they brought in Philippa Boyens and she sort of helped to like, as far as I can tell, she a lot of what she did was like the 
the structure kind of admin work. Not that she didn't do a ton of writing and everything too, but she was sort of taking their ideas and saying, how can we actually organize this into a way that that feels cohesive? And, uh, you know, so just like they described it as controlled chaos to just sort of like, here's all our ideas. Now, how do we funnel this all into these movies? Do you know how long they were in like development on the script, Brian? Basically, what I know is that production started around... 98 i think and they sort of started at least thinking about it in 95 96 but i think it was like not until 96 97 they actually uh, that they actually started like really getting putting work into it but it's just weird to think that these movies like before the matrix was being made like these movies were already being made like that just seems bizarre (laughs) and it was like an incredibly correct me if i'm wrong but it was an incredibly long production right because they shot them all it was 16 At the same months. Time? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, I think 14 months of shooting and then obviously years of post production and then coming back for reshoots. Like the cast had this, you know, these emotional goodbyes at, in, to, in 2000, I think, uh, or whenever they wrapped. And then they came back three years later to like film pickups for Return of the King. So, like mm-hmm. back in New Zealand, all doing the scene with Sam and Frodo where uh and Gollum, where the Gollum throws the the lemba spread over the edge mm-hmm. sam's shots were shot like one of the first things they shot and they were just like we're not ready to film this yet you know what do you this is crazy like andy circus hadn't even been hired yet it was just this but then elijah wood shots were shot three years later <laughs> when they went That's back so to do pickups nice. it's bizarre that is so crazy <laughs> movies <laughs> the cool thing is like you can know that stuff and then watch a scene and still totally buy it. You're not like, well, now I can't believe this anymore. You know, and I think that's really nice. I wouldn't have thought that about that scene. Like there's no indication when you watch that scene that there's some mismatch in the performances or that Sam is acting something else. Well, it reminds me of when we were talking about Jaws and we talked about some of the like pickups they went back to do and some of the most, you know, there are a few iconic moments from Jaws now because the production was a disaster to begin with, but then they were just like, we, we need to add some pieces and they went back and did pickups. There's a reason why pickups exist and, and they often don't get like recognized or called out or talked about ever. But knowing how like what you need and how to go back and get it is an incredible skill. So yeah. I'm like super impressed with Peter <laughs> Jackson for that reason. After they won Best Picture for Return of the King, they were still shooting some stuff for the extended. <laughs> Peter's like, what? like, well, I mean, I mean, they had like one shot that he was like, oh, I didn't get this one shot, so we need to go like put a bunch of skulls in the Hall of the Dead and like film them falling and stuff. So he, but he's uh, like making a joke. He's like, well, we already won Best Picture. What are we worried about? <laughs> so strange. <laughs> like, has any other movie like done pickups after winning Best Picture? Right. <laughs> well, that's what's so cool about. I just like that the film can be that, and that they were successful enough and had you know the money and resources to allow themselves time to like people cared enough to say, we want this to be as good as possible. So let's go shoot more. Like let's spend more money to make this thing even better if we can, which feels rare to like really be able to do that the way you want to be able to. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the cool thing too, is to see then once they started getting into production, just how how much work went into it they they storyboarded the whole thing they hired like six new zealand actors to read the entire script so that they could like watch a storyboarded version of the movie with dialogue then they would start using figurines they would like build mini sets and put little toys and stuff and just film shots to start getting an idea of how they wanted to do stuff then they were talking to Lucasfilm, who was doing some previs, like CG type stuff. And they're like, oh, here's our software. And they said, cool, now we can actually shoot entire segments. We can like see what these, what an entire sequence looks like. The Basil- Battle of Casa Doom, they, they shot that entire thing before a single actor had showed up to, you know, had maybe even been cast. So basically doing all this stuff so that when they got on set, they were able to, one, know what they were doing and get it done, but then to experiment. And so many moments in these movies are an actor saying, what if I did this? You know, what if like it was Bernard Hill's idea to like hit all the the spears 
before mm. they like during oh, that so speech, cool. right. you know, <laughs> just like little things like that. And of course, you can't do that if you have no idea what you're doing. If you've already right. sort of like planned out, like literally shots, like we need the camera to move in like this and then turn. Okay, cool, we got it. And then when on the day, you can actually do that stuff. Well, it's so interesting to me because when you said when we were talking about the pickups, it's like, well, Peter Jackson sounds incredibly like um, you know exacting and like a total perfectionist if he wants a shot of skulls tumbling and right. he he like goes back and gets it. <laughs> But then giving actors the freedom and like improvising on set is also the opposite of what I think of as being a total perfectionist or a control freak. Yeah, he, he's really not like that's the cool thing is he's very he, it's not control freak. It's he sort of has a very clear idea of what he wants, but he's also happy to have someone else help that idea. So if someone says, what if I did this? He can sort of run it through his factory and go. Yeah, I don't think that works. Or he can go, yeah, that sounds great. That's way better than what we're going to do. Let's do that instead. You know, and I think that like that's what you want in a, in a director. And I think he's just also been happy to try a bunch of stuff. There are scenes yeah. they shot five different ways. And it wasn't until ADR where they actually found the tone uh, mm. of exactly what they were trying to do. You know, so it was he was also just so committed to after production wrapped to continue sculpting these movies and every note of the score and you know effects and editing and all that kind of stuff and that's a huge part of it too because you film this footage and nothing else works then you don't have a good movie you know we just talked about soul and pixar and pixar's process of like planning and you know remaking the movie every time they have a new draft of the script and stuff and that's i want film to be more like that. And I think that's obviously one of the things that was special about these movies is Mm -hmm. because of the way they were made and where they were made and just all these like unique circumstances, it allowed them to do stuff like that. And that clearly that is useful and important on any movie of any size, because once you, you have a plan of what you think the movie is going to be, and then you go off to war and you shoot a movie and then you come back with footage. And then it's like, well, What did we get? Let's make a movie out of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it works when you put it all together and sometimes it doesn't. Or there are pieces that like, you know, everything else worked, but this is the climax and that doesn't work. And so the whole movie doesn't work. And so, you know, in a perfect world, you could make the movie once and then be like, these are the parts we need to make over again Mm -hmm. and reiterate and revise, especially in a movie that's this huge. I think it, it seems clear that that's why they were able to deliver this kind of consistent level of quality with it because you can't you know on like a 90 minute movie there's no way to know exactly how everything's going to arc and flow and the way it's going to feel let alone a you know nine, <laughs> nine ten hour, hour yeah. movie. <laughs> right, right so yeah it's so great that they had the the luxury not that it's a luxury that's just tons of extra work also yeah, to be yeah, doing yeah. Yeah. but to have that opportunity is so cool I, I mean the word luxury does come to mind though because there's like an ex- extravagance here that is is pretty unreal when you look at how the actual production too, like the bigotures which we talked about a little bit um, in the last episode where john howe and alan lee would design something like orthanc or baradour and then they would build something that was 20 feet tall uh, you know, like some of these cities or Helm's Deep or whatever, like they built it the entire size of a room so that you could get so detailed that the camera could actually move in and and you would see, you know, Compton actors walking on the set, obviously. But if you looked at the background and looked at the wall, it would look like a full size wall with a little, you know, piece knocked out of it or something. And uh, yeah, like Minas Tirith was over 20 feet tall. They built the entire freaking thing. They built a Helm's Deep that was one quarter the size of the real Helm's <laughs> Deep insane. to blow up and just so it could be in the background of some shots. And and then all of the all of the scale stuff, obviously, like just to get a shot of Gandalf and Frodo sitting at a table or maybe Bilbo where the camera spins around, they not only use force perspective where Ian McKellen is close and, and um, you know, Bilbo Frodo is in the back, but they built a rig that moves when the camera moves. The yep. th- oh, and it's like, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I appreciate you did it. And it's awesome. But and then, of course, they hired they had doubles. So they had for every each one of those actors, there's like an actor, a double smaller than them or a double bigger than them in cases like Gandalf stunt double, you know, all this kind of stuff. They built stilts with like rubber hands for Brie so that when right. someone walks between them and pushes by, it's just right. a person like on stilts with like big rubber hands. And again, it's like, I don't, I mean, maybe it would have been better if they committed to one 
way of doing it and just stuck with that because no. you do well because sometimes you notice <laughs> sometimes sometimes you're going oh clearly like that's somebody with a mask on or clearly that's they're comped in in front or whatever but also for every time you notice there are 20 times right. you don't notice and i think that's that's what you do get from using all that variety exactly i mean i think to me the fact that they were able to do such variety is what sets it apart from, for example, the Hobbit trilogy and how the Hobbit trilogy feels where it is more of a like across the board CGI fest. I think there's something yep. more timeless about Lord of the Rings. Obviously, yeah. some effects age better than others, but because of this mix, the mixed bag allows it to age well and to feel more timeless than if they had committed 100% to CGI is good enough now. Everything's going to be CG that can oh, be. Oh, definitely. Uh, it, all those bigotries. Like, I love the way Minas Tirith looks and feels and how solid it feels. It's not this just you know 3D graphic being projected onto the landscape. It really is this hard thing. you know. So, so I, I, I'm so glad that they had the luxury of this vast combination of effect styles because otherwise I don't think it would feel the way it does today. Yeah, definitely. This particular movie, Return of the King, to me, though, is the most CGI and like feels where the Shire and some of the earlier locations and things and like, you know, all the Hobbit stuff that we're talking about with the perspective, all of that is kept kind of, yeah, really grounded in everything in the first two movies. And I actually feel like all three of these movies, there's like a step up and a step up into mm -hmm. like more magic and CGI and whatever. So by the time in, in this one that we get to the ghost army, I'm yeah. like, <laughs> and then this movie turns into Pirates of the Caribbean for a few minutes. <laughs> Which as they were designing the ghost army, the Pirates of the Caribbean trailer came out. I don't, I, maybe Orlando Bloom didn't tell them, but, <laughs> but they're like, oh, somebody's already doing this. Whoops. And they're like, well, all right. Okay. So they're, they're an army of the dead. Sorry, just to jump to this really fast. They're yeah. an army of the dead that's under a curse and they want to be at peace. Uh-huh. But they can't until the curse is lifted. But while they are undead, they are an impossibly strong fighting force and no one can defeat them. Is And they get there on boats, is all I'm saying. <laughs> it's yep. just like, I was like, hey, uh, this is Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. I remember Peter Jackson and, and one of the special features, maybe the commentaries, talking about how he was kind of dreading the army of the dead stuff because yeah. once again, in like a literary work, it's kind of abstract maybe, or it's not, you, you don't have to picture it literally or like right. really understand what's happening literally. But for a film, it's like, no, their ghost swords actually do cut people down <laughs> and like, but only yeah. Aragorn sword can stop it. And he, he, he knew that it was kind of a weak point of the narrative that there's this like, deus ex machina ghost army that can just come in and sweep out the enemy but that is what happens in the books i believe you know i think that is kind of how it goes down mm -hmm. so it, i i feel for peter jackson because it's an easy like target for this film of like oh this is sure. kind of bs that just call an army of the dead but it's like that is how it goes down in the book and ultimately you have to resolve the battle somehow so i guess do it the way the book did. <laughs> <laughs> do it with these green guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. The green wave will sweep through the city and kill only bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> what you just mentioned is maybe like the, the one thing that I feel like Return of the King suffers for a little bit is this the need to make literal things that I, I think an abstract or in a book like are much more powerful than a, when you point a camera at the thing happening, yeah. like a description, like you're just saying, of an army of the dead washes over the battlefield and afterward only the allies are left standing. Like you can read that and be like, cool, all right, that sounds awesome. And then when you point a camera at it, it's like, that's really goofy and convenient that this is a thing that's happening. And I feel like there are things kind of throughout Return of the King that for me kind of creates a distance where it's like seeing you put this thing literally on screen in front of me is taking me out of it. So in the moment, I'm not super duper feeling it. But after the scene is over, I'm like, the meaning of all of that is very powerful. And I feel like that's kind of overall my relationship with this film is like the actual like scene by scene things a lot of the time don't work for me. But what it all adds up to definitely does. And that is kind of like you're saying, Trisha, a difference between this film and the fellowship where everything does just feel like it's 
it's all on screen and it's so believable mm-hmm. that I get sucked into the world completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for me, that's my problem with Legolas getting onto the horse in Two Towers, the <laughs> shot that I mentioned, <laughs> is it's like the only thing in that movie that makes me go, oh, okay, we're, that's like a CG thing that they did. And now I'm thinking about they did a CG thing, you know? I mean, the wargs are pretty... The that wargs too. themselves, sure. <laughs> but like the wargs and Gollum, it's sort of like once you show it to me, then then it's there, you know? Yeah. And like, I also was not a big fan of Legolas sliding down the stairs on his shield, but at least that was practically done. They like did it with, mm-hmm. you know, strings and stuff, obviously. But at least I'm like, well, what I'm looking at actually happened to some extent, as opposed to uh, clearly like these, you know, this was just all CG. It's also sort of the attitude of like, how hard are you committing to to the sort of believability of this. And I think that you get the, the maybe my least favorite moment in the entire trilogy is when Gothmog, who's like the head of the the army that's that's coming into Minas Tirith, the guy with like the really screwed about up face. Marshmallow, marshmallow, orc. marshmallow face. Yes, he is one of the <laughs> he is one of the lows that I previously <laughs> referred to. Like, I feel like he's like a proto version of the annoying white orc CG villains in the Hobbit movies. Uh huh. Anytime they try to make an orc have a personality or be distinctive, <laughs> I'm like, stop it. That's not what orcs stop. are for. Exactly. <laughs> That's not what they're there for. They're not supposed to be people. They're just supposed to be orcs. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is Peter Jackson like walked into when they were doing designing his face and he he just was like, no. And he just grabbed some like clay and just shoved it on. And he's like, just do that now. And they're like, wow. okay. okay. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But no, it's the moment where the like trebuchet goes off and the rock is falling and then uh-huh. he sti- sidesteps the rock and then it cuts to a troll going like, Bleh? like giving yeah. him like, oh, yeah. like a worried <laughs> look. And I'm like, yep. wait, what is this? And, and you know, we'll talk about the Hobbit, but like it just felt like now we're we're so far removed from this like very real kind of feeling. Granted, these are little moments in right. a four hour movie. Um and then the the big one is Legolas versus the Mumakill, which I'm like, this is really corny, but like I love it. <laughs> like that's the one where I'm like, you know what? When it's I fine. saw this in theaters in the pack crowd, uh-huh. like <laughs> just give it to me. I'm fine with it. Just right. let's just do it. I'm like, I'm like, Him. it was worth the 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 sort of corny. It was worth my brain going into, oh, I'm watching like a kind of bouncy movie to like just for the payoff of me being pretty happy with it by the end. I mean, I like anybody taking down an ATAT, so <laughs> I, I very I'm much saying. enjoy it. AON yeah. actually does like an ATAT, like yeah. cut them at the legs move. Yeah. Right. Just while we're on the subject of kind of goofy literalizing of things that maybe doesn't work in film form, one of the other things like I really I had a sinking feeling in Two Towers and then it got fully realized in Return of the King was the increasing literalization of the Eye of Sauron. Where mm. in two towers, yes. it's like, okay, it's like an f- energy force field actually being generated at the top of a tower. That was already freaking me out. Because, yeah, once again, in the books, there's no indication that he has like a like location, you know, on the right. top of the tower. And then when he becomes literally a lighthouse, like a, like a kind of a, <laughs> like a, like a frantic lighthouse that yep. is like very right. rapidly twitching around, kind of looking at stuff. In Return of the King, I was like, my heart kind of sank. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, it was so much better when he's just like this ghostly presence when you put the ring on. Like, why? We don't need this. I get that you're trying to like, you know, kind of dumb it down to say like, we're drawing his eye away. But I don't know. You can, I can get that you're drawing his eye away without literally the lighthouse (laughs) turning to like shine the light on you. Right. Uh, Anyway, that's. So that's my other kind of my big problem with the way they chose to film a literary thing is the concretization of the Eye of Sauron. I think I would have done differently personally. As you all know, all of us here at Beyond the Screenplay love Jurassic Park. I know Alex in particular has talked about how fascinated he was by dinosaurs when he was a kid and how he wanted to learn everything about them. You also probably know that a lot has been learned about dinosaurs since Jurassic Park was released, how they behave, where they lived, and how they looked. 
If you want to get updated on all the new information we have about dinosaurs, I recommend checking out the documentary Amazing Dino World on CuriosityStream. In the documentary, they detail many of the new discoveries, reveal new fossils, and feature very high quality renders of scientists' best guesses at what dinosaurs really looked like. Truly, the CGI in this documentary impressed me. It shows how far visual effects have come since Jurassic Park, and feels like a worthy companion as far as dinosaur visuals go. It's just one of the thousands of educational documentaries available on CuriosityStream, and you can get 41% off their annual plans by signing up using our link in the show notes, curiositystream.com slash screenplay. You'll also get complimentary access to Nebula, the streaming service created by a group of educational YouTubers, which our channel's lessons from the screenplay and story mode are a part of. Nebula has a bunch of original, exclusive content from some of YouTube's best creators. So head to curiositystream.com slash screenplay to get thousands of great documentaries and access to Nebula. Thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. I will say, though, I was poking into this because I was super curious about it. And what you were saying about the Army of the Dead, Alex, seems to be true for a lot of the things that I think of as being, you know, sort of cinema conventions or um yeah like just quote unquote movie stuff where i'm like ah i roll movie stuff mm. and then i look at it i you know you i poked into some of it and it's like well no that's tolkien like right that's in there so i remember i actually and i'm sorry i know this wasn't everyone's reactions i actually groaned um when eowyn takes off her helmet and she's like i'm no man and sure. she stabs the largest ring wraith who has a name, probably. The Witch King of Angmar. Witch King, thank you. Um, anyway, <laughs> stabs him in the face. And I was like, come on now. That's <sighs> some like smarmy feminist nonsense that we just put in this movie because we felt bad there were no women in this movie earlier. And that's straight from Tolkien, mm -hmm. apparently. Like the line is there. The whole thing of her being in the battle is there. And, you know, I... I feel a little bit differently, actually, having watched the extended editions where all of the character relationships are given more time, and that includes Eowyn. Mm -hmm. And I feel definitely differently about it now. Um, but yeah, there there were multiple instances where I was like, this seems like it's just movie nonsense, but actually it's literary. And, and I think just part of the nature of the adaptation is... Yeah, trying to capture some of that stuff, the spirit of it, you know, and not losing the spirit of it and still kind of keeping that stuff in there. And I know for and I know I read this, too, that like in the book, you don't know she's on the battlefield. Mm. Like you don't know until she takes off her helmet. But they like shot Miranda Otto, you know, a lot earlier. And we have that goofy thing where she takes down the elephant. But <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how I would have done it. If I was given that same source material, mm -hmm. this is exactly how I would have done it. And Miranda Otto does crush it. No, oh, yeah. The thing that the movie does that is a bit of the schmarmy feminism edition is essentially tying her, like, stabbing the ring wraith in the face. It's it's almost like she, like, owned him with, like, her smackdown of, like, I am no man and, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. blew his mind so much that he implodes. <laughs> but, but, yes. but actually, what happened a moment before that is Mary he died of surprise. Yeah, kind of. It's kind of what the movie makes you feel like. It's like no man can kill him, but like you were totally just mind blown, so you're you're dead. Uh, but but what happens actually is Mary stabs him in the leg, and in the right. books, Mary actually has a dagger, like an ancient dagger from some point earlier in the journey, that cool. is a rare dagger that can kill uh, ring rates. G Galadriel gave it to him, right? I think yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm have, not sure. Have you run it's... out of those nice shiny daggers? <laughs> right. So so I think I think basically. In the book, it's pretty clear that Mary kills the ring wraith with that dagger stab. There's still the reveal of Eowyn on the battlefield. There's still the line, like, I am no man. But I don't think her, like, female power implodes right. the ring wraith. That's it's actually, literally the thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so that, that, that's what the movie kind of suggests, which right. I think is that's where, that's where the change is from the book. In the book, it's pretty clear the ring, ring wraith was killed because of a particular dagger, not right. because of girl power. Interesting. Yeah, it does share a thematic element with the entire story, though, which is you have these sort of 
race of people who are not thought to be equal to others, to, to the men, elves, and dwarves who do this amazing thing. And then that's what Mary and Eowyn are both dealing with going right. into battle. People are like, oh, sure, you're a soldier, but like you should probably go take care of these people instead of actually fighting, you know? So even though, yeah, it does feel a little movie-ish, um, it's still sort of, it, it, it fits in with what the entire story is about, at least. Right. The whole, the whole story is about the people who are unlikely and not thought of as heroes right. being the true heroes. Right. And and just not to spend too much time on it, but I, you know, did a detour into like feminist critiques of Tolkien. Mm. And there are many. And, um, you know, it's, you know, sort of different couple different lines of scholarly thought about, you know, how to sort of read Tolkien um, through that lens. But one of the more interesting sort of angles that I've seen on his work has to do with this exact thing that you're talking about, Alex, which is that the spirit of the story is about a contrast between people who value sort of like, I don't know, not traditionally masculine, you know, sort of traits where hobbits value good food and families gardening. and being at home and and simple lives and gardening. They don't value wealth. They don't value power. They don't war. War. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. They're not violent people, right? So like the entire thing, and I think you know, my sister recently sent me a paper that she wrote in college that is basically an argument that Sam is is, you know, sort of the hero or like more like the heart Absolutely. of yeah. these stories. <laughs> and so I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that like, you know, this is a critique of like some of those more toxic masculine traits from a feminist angle necessarily, but it is a critique overall, I think, in the sense that the lives of the hobbits are here to represent a contrast to this more warlike, you know, lust for power kind of mentality that that ultimately like following that way we see leads to the destruction of Middle Earth. And like, it, you know, if more people valued, I think it's the end of The Hobbit, the book, if more people valued food and good cheer and those kinds of things, then the world would be a better place mm -hmm. um, is sort of the sentiment from Tolkien here. And so, yeah, I agree. I think the movie does a really good job of capturing all of that. And we can talk more about Sam later, but I'm with <laughs> you. Yeah. Having having a hobbit and a woman team up to take down this like great evil, I think is a really cool embodiment of that idea. Yeah, I love the pairings that happen in this movie because we have yeah. in Two Towers, we have kind of hobbits are all just with hobbits, you know, like we got two hobbits with Gollum, two hobbits with Treebeard, which aren't really like people. They're different mm. than, you know, whatever. <laughs> but in this movie, we we get to have Mary with Eowyn and we get to have Pippin go off with Gandalf, which is really fun because they're set up as kind of being at odds in the first, you know, in Fellowship. Right. Pippin is making everything go wrong. Gandalf has a lot of scorn towards him, even though he still kind of loves all the hobbits. He targets Pippin as like, yeah. you know, fool of a took. Yeah. And I really love like it, part of the thrill of watching this film in theaters for the first time was after spending so much time watching and rewatching Fellowship in Two Towers. It was like a thrill to have a different combo of characters yeah. in this third movie. And like so refreshing to have Gandalf riding off with Pippin and have all these scenes with them together. The one thing I love about this movie is how much Gandalf is at the front and center yeah. of the Battle of Minas Tirith. Because yes, uh, the Battle for Helm's Deep is excellent and great, but I just I don't I don't have a fondness necessarily for like King Theoden or like the plight of the Rohan people the same way I have for just Gandalf in any scene ever. Like I, anytime <laughs> Gandalf is in a scene, I'm just more into it because he brings this kind of more unpredictable energy. He's not a stoic, you know, just a stoic yeah. war torn, yeah. heavy person. He kind of makes jokes and has a little gleam in his eye and is not taking everything a hundred percent seriously, but also dead serious when he needs to. So the fact that he is kind of leading the charge in this movie during the big battle was more my taste, actually, than the more Helm's Deep vibe. Like, I really right. love the way the Battle of Minas Tirith unfolds. Like, you have the first volley of, I don't know, big rocks being slung at each other. <laughs> Stone, <laughs> like, building pieces. Yeah, yeah. De Denethor is being really annoying, and I'm just sick of Denethor. And then Gandalf comes in yep. and literally smacks him down. Like, literally smacks him yeah. down with his It's very satisfying. Staff, and then just takes charge. And then there's these increasing waves of awesome of now the ring racer here 
I think this battle is so much fun. And I get that it's more mm. CG and it's more like it maybe doesn't age as well visually, but I actually find every wave of this battle to be such pure fun and enjoyment. The way that it unfolds and intercuts with other storylines, I never get bored in a way that I honestly, during some stretches of Helm's Deep, because of the kind of the monochrome like color palette and the darkness and the rain, which I know are all the reasons Michael likes it. <laughs> to me, it starts to kind of get blurry and kind of blur together visually sometimes. And I kind of lose track of where I am spatially. And there's something about just the dynamics and the brightness and the layers of the city and all the things that are happening in Minas Tirith that I find actually more fun to watch. So I just <laughs> always have a really good time during that entire battle. And then it ends with giant elephants storming in and stepping on horses and I'm just, I'm just a happy camper. Wow. <laughs> Alex hates horses, by the way. <laughs> and, and then, of course, you get Gandalf's scene with Pippin, which is just the most beautiful. Like, yeah. oh, oh, when, oh, when they're holed up and yeah, yeah, they're facing you know, death. Oh, I love that scene. Which is Tolkien's description of the Grey Havens in the yes. book. He said, oh, there's white shores, da, da, da. And Fran Walsh had the idea to actually give it to Gandalf a character who has died, right? Uh, you know, as as this monologue about like, oh, this is this is here's this beautiful thing that I saw that I that I experienced, and then of course you give it to Ian McKellen who has to know how to act having died, and <laughs> Ian McKellen knocks it out of the park. And the thing that bugs me is when you talk about Oscars, you know, you say best actor, you know, best performance, whatever, but Hannibal Lecter didn't get nominated the second and third time Anthony Hopkins played that role and Ian McKellen didn't get nominated the second and third time he played that role. So it's like, is it best or is it we weren't expecting this and it was surprising, but now that we've already seen you do it, it doesn't matter anymore because <laughs> right. I feel like like I would have loved to see Ian McKellen not get nominated for fellowship and then like win for Return During of the, the clean, King. During the clean sweep year when like he was allowed to win. I feel like his performance in that moment is just so breathtaking you know the way and billy boyd pippin just sort of being so like hungry for you know he says he's he says, oh, and then you see it and he says yeah. what what gandalf you know he's like so like ready to hear it and then he says he says oh the white shores and he says oh that's not so bad and then ian mckellen just has that little twinkle in his eye says no it's not <laughs> oh just the twinkle it's all about yeah. the ian mckellen twinkle it's so exactly <laughs> also fun fact uh no special effects with any of the stuff that gandalf does it's all ian mckellen wow oh, oh, oh no, yeah. no no stunt doubles no, no, I mean like the 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 light coming out of his staff, all that stuff. <laughs> right, just a little yeah. twinkle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's why you hire, that's one of the great things you get when you hire Ian McKellen. Yeah. An actual yeah. wizard, yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. That's just, those, are, those are actual shots of him charging across the field with a massive beam of light. <laughs> a mini lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> that that yeah. I liked. I liked that visualization from the Mini books. lighthouse that is okay. I do like that there's like a maximum size cap on acceptable lighthouses <laughs> where where do we draw the line with beams of light right. here i will i will say just regarding that moment like that was part of why i was so happy to see gandalf just kind of return as like a main character because i love i like his kind of magic in this world like i think it's fun to see wizards get to be wizards in this elegant way like the, the way that's visualized where he just basically like shines light at the ring race and it kind of repels them is like a beautifully minimalist way to, sh to show a wizard doing something awesome and it, mm -hmm. and i missed that kind of in two towers we didn't you know he comes at the end and charges down the hill and that's kind of his big moment but he's really off doing errands for a lot of two towers and <laughs> and it was just it was just nice to get to like no he's here to stay he's with us for the whole movie this time and we get to have him you know be a part of this decisive battle for middle earth the character of Gandalf really is one of the best mentor characters, I think. And when you look at these like classic, you know, sort of hero's journey stories, no shade on Obi-Wan, Dumbledore and all of those guys, <laughs> Morpheus, right? No shade on him. He's a great mentor. I think that what you're saying about Gandalf is really true. And it goes back to fellowship. And in, in our fellowship episode, we talked about how fallible and sort of yeah, weakened he can be. Like, and the fact that fellowship ends with his death, you know, we see Obi-Wan comes back, right? Like in spirit, sort of, when he's one with the force. But 
for Gandalf to return in physical form and essentially be the same character, maybe a little wiser, maybe a little more powerful in different ways, but essentially be the same character that we already love with this extra knowledge that he has having gone beyond the veil at that, you know, after the end of fellowship. I think there's something really special about the design of the character that makes him even more sort of like trustworthy and authoritative and still fallible. Like we know he can fail. We know we saw, we saw him die. We saw him come back, but we saw him die. Right. And we've seen him be confused. We've seen him make mistakes. He worries a lot. Yes. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So much of of watching E. McKellen's performance is looking at Gandalf and seeing him worry that he's making the wrong decision, that he's putting the hobbits, you know, in the wrong place or sending them to their deaths. And like, I feel like that's the entire thing of when he, you know, takes Pippin here to Minas Tirith. He's desperate and worried. He's never con- he's not never confident, but he's rarely confident that things are actually going to work out. Like he's very powerful, but he doesn't know the future. And I think that that's super important. Yeah. Well, because I think even comparing him like you did to like Morpheus, like Morpheus, his character is, he has to believe like there's a certainty of like Neo will be the one, this will happen. And so that, that is powerful and useful in that story, but doesn't give that room for him to be as much of a three-dimensional person, like you're saying. And so I, I think- Gandalf can be confident, but he's never certain that everything's going to work out really well. And that, I think, keeps us on that fence also. Of like, we're hoping, like, this seems like our best chance and let's, let's do it. But it's never like he's just waiting around for all the things to magically happen as he has foreseen them to happen. Right. Right. Well, and the movie is very early on when they, when they go to Edoras for the kind of post-Helm's Deep celebration, his brief dialogue with, with Aragorn is all about Mm-hmm. Him kind of doubting himself about sending Frodo off and mm-hmm. how do we know Frodo's alive? Maybe he's dead already and this is all screwed. And he he really doesn't have confidence in his in his big plan, which is sending this hobbit off to destroy the ring. So I, I think the whole movie doesn't ever give us this confidence that Gandalf has this magical foresight and plan and, and whatever he sets into motion is going to work out. He really doesn't know. And so it, it all is uncertain. As a screenwriting choice, it forces Gandalf to do work in the way that we're talking about. Like, because he doesn't have any sort of, yeah, there's no magical plan that we he's confident is going to work out. At every moment, he is wrestling and having to, like, do the work of whatever needs to be done. And there's a desperation to that and a panic to that. I was thinking about, I think it's during the the battle at Minas Tirith, where there's an orc that starts, like, smack talking Gandalf at some point. Maybe you guys remember it. I don't know. It's it's in this movie for sure. And somebody's like, you know, somebody basically is like, give up Gandalf. You can't beat me. I don't know who it is. Is that ex- <laughs> is that extended edition? Maybe. Are you, are you talking about the mouth of Sauron? <laughs> maybe. Uh, B- Bruce no, Willis? No, uh, I don't think it's that. Anyway, old somebody, gray beard. somebody is trying. Somebody is trying to trash talk Gandalf before they fight him. And I remember <laughs> just watching it and being like, bro, it's Gandalf. Like, there is. <laughs> bro. It's like, there is no way. Like, I saw him take down this fire demon in the first movie. There is no way that you are going to take him down. You're just an orc or whatever it is that you are, this creature. <laughs> but Gandalf doesn't receive the taunt that way. <laughs> like, Gandalf receives the taunt as though he is going to have to fight for his life against, you know, to my mind, someone who is not worth his time. But like, that's kind of what I'm talking about with the design of the character. Stop it. I'm just like, I'm picturing you like riding with Gandalf as like his like buddy (laughs) and like people come up and want to fight him and like, bro, it's Gandalf. Like, honestly, I don't, Gandalf, I don't think this person is even worth your time, but like, bro, it's (laughs) Gandalf. Well, that's how I feel, but, but, that's why I'm saying Ian McKellen is so good and mm-hmm. the direction here is so good. The writing here is so good that threats are treated by Gandalf as threats, right? Yeah. He doesn't have swagger, even though he probably should. He doesn't walk around acting like he's totally in control of everything. That is good character design for a mentor character. Nobody wants a mentor character that's too powerful. He has to be human. And this is like a really, really perfect example of it. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Should we talk about Sam and Frodo? Yeah, always. 
<laughs> I just want to hug him. Like, so much. I'm still upset at the lie that Sam tells at the end of the movie or when he's on the the mountain with Frodo and he's like, if ever I was to marry someone, it would be Rosie Cotton. And I'm just like, no, Sam, it would be Frodo. Like, why can't you people see that you love each other? Like, what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful platonic love story. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's really, I mean, and it's like Sam, I think why his character is so special is he has such like a pure love for Frodo that even though Frodo like does all the worst things in this movie and like truly is like the worst person to Sam basically you know when he gets back to Frodo when Frodo has been taken to the top of that like orc tower in Mordor the way Sam looks at him is like pure love like it's it's yeah. like, it's so sweet the way he's like you're safe now Mr. Frodo I'm here there's something you don't really see that usually like in movies, like something so earnest and so maybe almost embarrassing how earnest it is, but they just go for it. And Sean Astin so commits to it. And it's such a beautiful thing. It it is a very rare type of like friendship love that is rarely like shown. And that's why I think so many of us have just our hearts melt for Sam immediately because he's Mm -hmm. just such a special character in that way. He is embodying all of this even at the end. Like he's amidst the den of evil. Like they're surrounded by, you know, darkness and pessimism. And like Sam is just infallibly has this love for like Frodo and this willingness to sacrifice. And so I feel like Sam kind of embodies everything that is like the anti Sauron. And it's just, I think, helps it make it that much more powerful. Right. Because Frodo, as protagonist, ultimately, you know, he is taken by the ring. Ultimately, right. he's, he doesn't escape yeah. the rings, even as a hobbit, which is the most resilient against its powers. He's been wearing it for a whole year. It's, it's you know, there's no, yeah. there's no escaping it. He makes it pretty far, to, like, to be fair. He makes mm-hmm. it right. like no. 99% like, of the way Like, way there. farther yeah. than any, any man would, you know, obviously. Mm-hmm. He is ultimately taken by the ring and isn't able to destroy it himself. That's why Sam feels like the more classic hero archetype like like a more mythic hero that is never corrupted that isn't taken by the dark side whereas frodo almost has like an anti-hero ending Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but he has redemption and and kind of a sad war vet sort of an ending of somebody somebody who has made it home from war but never really recovers right but but sam does feel like the hero of these movies in the sense of the person that just remains good throughout and isn't corrupted at all. So, and, and, and I just love that they sold and achieved the moment where Sam says, you know, I, I may, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. Cause that's, mm. that's one of those moments in the book it was very special in the book that, that moment. And it's hard to translate to screen a moment like that. And I saw some faces when I said that maybe it didn't work for anybody else. But but for me, I think it works, Alex. For me, like when I saw it put in movie form with that Grey Havens music coming up and the visual of like the mountain and the lava, I was like, you did it, Peter Jackson. You took mm. these maybe cheesy literary things and you, you like Sean Astin managed to embody a character that I believe is doing yeah. this and saying mm-hmm. this which I think would be very difficult. Like it, it, I was thinking like who else could play this character? Like how could it not be Sean Astin? Like there's he and this character feel so one and the same. Now it seems impossible mm-hmm. to imagine a different actor pulling it off. Definitely. I feel like it's that way with all the cast in some ways where like right. thinking back, it's like, it's weird that you thought that that person could play this role, but also no one else could play that role. Like right. how did you know that that was the perfect casting for everybody? I also want to shout out, um, while we're talking about casting, uh, Lawrence Bahare, because we've talked about Lurtz in the first movie, the like lead Urukai. We talked about Gothmog, Marshmallow Face, and we talked about the Witch King of Angmar, <laughs> all played by Maori actor Lawrence what? Bahare. Yeah, it's like 6'4", and just badass. like this, yeah, total badass built dude, and definitely the least recognized actor in the mm. trilogy, <laughs> simply because no matter how much you've seen him. And yet such an MVP. And Exactly. And then also, just, we can go back to Sam and Frodo, but just Christopher Lee, like as yeah. just a total, total Tolkien nerd, like he would just come <laughs> up to to cast members and say, 
I read Lord of the Rings once a year. And just like, <laughs> just to tell them so they know. And, uh, you know, of course, then to cut him out entirely of the theatrical edition of this movie feels like so harsh. Uh, so I'm glad that we get the, the Saruman's death scene and stuff. He's like also the only cast member to have met Tolkien because he's a million years old. Sure. You know? So like he was around back in the day. He like advised Peter Jackson on how he should sound when he gets stabbed in the back because that's a thing he's experience like just Christopher Lee <laughs> sure. like, is who you want as your main on-screen villain in your movie. I mean, definitely. And, and I want to circle back to the the Saruman death scene. But before we get too far away from Sam, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about some of the changes that they made from the book. Everything, we talked about this in the last episode, basically every change that, especially in the characters, that is different from the book was made for good, strong screenwriter reasons, and mm. they were the right choices. I, mm. I fully believe, because the Sam and Frodo rift that is such a critical part of the middle of this movie doesn't happen in the books. Right. And they, they're just like a team together. They like go fight Shelob together, and they're, you know, together until the end. And, you know, having the ring, you know, I have doubts about how... <laughs> this works and I hate Frodo because of it, but having the <laughs> ring corrupt his mind so much or like deteriorate his mind and his like reasoning so much that he can be swayed by Gollum and believe Gollum over Sam, mm -hmm. I think is good, smart screenwriting. It is compelling. Like we were talking about in the last episode with like, I hate Gollum and I find him really annoying and I don't know why anyone would trust him over Sam, but on paper, you're adding conflict to a storyline that otherwise doesn't have a ton of interior conflict. You're giving an arc to Frodo and Sam's relationship that pays off in that moment where Sam is like, I can carry you. And in that other beautiful moment that makes me cry every time after they get, you know, they destroy the ring. And, you know, Frodo says, I'm glad you're with me, Sam, here at the end of all things. Mm. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it creates an arc. There wouldn't be an mm -hmm. arc for this movie if that change wasn't made from the books. And so, like, everything that I have read about what they have changed from the book, like, they streamlined the whole middle of it with the geography of, like, where everything takes place and who's doing what different tasks and everything. All of those changes are just good, smart screenwriting things. Simplify. Make sure the character arcs are there. Because ultimately, we will not care about the plot if we do not care about the journey that the characters are going on. And so just what a credit to the screenwriting team here. I think it's incredible. And, and we get that the feelings that we have by Sam, you know, about Sam and Frodo at the end are created from some of those changes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting to see which things they went really hard on making sure they kept intact and which things they didn't. There's a story of when Frodo was waking up in Rivendell and Sam runs over and he says, Mr. Frodo, and he grabs his hand. He grabs his hand because Ian McKellen said, remember in the book, Sam grabs Frodo's hand. Fans are going to be looking for that. So like little moments like that they mm -hmm. would do. And then you move Shelob to the third movie. You completely cut Tom <laughs> Bombadil. You know, you, you move characters around and you do all this stuff. And the thing Peter Jackson said was, as long as the theme is intact, you know, like, like let's stay as true to Tolkien as possible, but the most important thing is we keep all these themes intact. Cut to one of the creators of the Game of Thrones show who said themes are for eighth grade book reports. <laughs> who stuck the landing better? I'll let you decide. But <laughs> but yeah, it's just it's it's a good lesson that that it's like, what is this thing about? Let's stay true to that. And there's been a lot of adaptations where you go, oh man, I was really looking forward to seeing this scene and that scene. It didn't really happen. But do I feel like I got the the feeling I got from reading this book on screen? Yes, I do. Job done. That's the theme. That's the theme. <laughs> it, it's interesting because as, as a book reader, you're talking about how you respect Trisha the way they they made more of an arc for Sam and Frodo. And it was very disconcerting for me, though, when I first saw the movie. Oh, interesting. Mm, for them to get to this point where Frodo just says, go home. Like, right. you're in the middle of Mordor, basically. You're like, you're on the stairs about to cross into Mordor. And Frodo's like, just go home like now. And I, that kind of broke the reality for me a little bit, maybe just because I was attached to their story in the books. And this was so far from it. And it was all based on like Lembus bread, which Frodo didn't <laughs> like wasn't even that hungry for anyway. And all right. anyway, so it was it felt 
more contrived to me because I knew th- I maybe because I knew that it was being invented for the movie. Mm. But I appreciate what it was doing. And I do think you need them to have a, a real rift. I maybe there was a there would have been a way to do it that felt a bit less contrived. But I, I understand why they did it and what effect it has. So I do respect the choice. When I saw that scene where Frodo was like, no, 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 Gollum's definitely right. You definitely ate all the bread, even though the scene began with you looking for the bread and alerting us to the fact that it's gone. <laughs> right. I definitely <laughs> believe that Gollum like, is right, that you ate it and then decided to tell us that it was gone. I don't know. There was a lot about that scene that like really bothered me. Right. And, and the fact that Frodo would just go all the way to the point of like, just walk home now. Like, go. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think one of the things they said they wanted to convey was sort of this addict mentality of like, right. it's not about the actual logic. It's about the fact that you are so, you know, distracted by this thing that that you just need to get everything out of the way. Although what I would like to see now is a cut where he says, Sam, go home. And Sam turns and leaves. And then Frodo goes a little bit further. And then we cut to Sam back in the Shire and he's reading a book. And then he sees something that reminds him of Frodo. And he goes, no, I got to go back. And then we cut to him. <laughs> I think what did work for me was Gollum poisoning Frodo's mind about the ring, about Sam is going to take right. the ring from you. Right, that right, right. makes sense to me as he's an addict and you're being told that your supposed friend is going to take your drugs from you. Right. That totally plugs in for me. So I think I think the contrived part was like the bread scenario of like, yeah. there's the crumbs, there's the bread, there's the missing things. I, I almost think that there maybe could have been a way to do it. Who knows? But maybe there could have been a way to do it where it, it did become about Sam just offering to take the ring to hold it for Frodo without having to do all the like bread mischief. Mm-hmm. That maybe would have smoothed it over for me personally. These, these are all my little, my little problems Mm-hmm. In, in one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, and it but, still helps that, like yeah. it climax with Sam fighting Shelob, which is like such a compelling fight also. Like it all it all works out and and ends up where I want it to. The other, yeah. just right, I'm on my little rant about my little book things, but I also think it's hilarious how rapidly all the orcs in this tower kill each other. <laughs> once like a... Like once a pretend fight like the starts, civil over, war. Like, yeah, yeah. Like like Sam is like walking up towards the tower, and like we hear the battle still happening, kind of, and then we cut to him walking in, and it's like almost entirely just dead orcs <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so there's there's some shortcuts happening. I felt like in this third movie that didn't quite plug. In. I feel like again, that's like kind of my issue with the whole movie is that it it feels a little bit like okay, well we got to wrap up now, so it's right. like. Sam comes and he will fight off three orc soldiers by himself. And mm. as Frodo is waking up, these this orc and this other orc thing that isn't an orc will be upset at each other and that will spark a civil war that will conveniently kill everybody. Like there's just a <laughs> lot of like convenient things that happen that I think again, as you guys are pointing out, as you were saying, Brian, like the themes behind them all still totally work and mm-hmm. are affecting. But for me, remove me from the feeling of like I'm watching a movie with like real stakes like it 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 gets that kind of the bouncy feeling of Mm -hmm. like the literal things that i'm watching right now aren't plugging in for me right but they are in service of a greater thing that that is working and so it creates the kind of an interesting uh experience going through especially the second half of, of this movie i mean first time i've ever heard of the criticism that this movie wraps things up too quickly (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah wraps up is maybe the wrong word uh, no i know what you mean there, yeah, yeah. there is there is a there's a point in this movie where especially i think when we get to like the finale finale once like aragorn is marching off from Minas Tirith to create the distraction where right. i don't even really watch it as a ground a grounded story anymore as no. much as just an emotional climax and mm-hmm. as an emotional climax it does it like it works for me so <laughs> well and like i i I'm so satisfied emotionally by that climax that I don't care that the ground only falls below the orcs and leaves an Which island like, of people. That yeah. stresses me out so much, though. Like, those are the things that break my brain. If, like, well, did they know, that, like, if the orcs had just formed a full circle, are our heroes dead for forever? Or it's just like, magic what? at that point. It's just the tower <laughs> fell and Sauron blew up and his explosion only kills orcs. You know, it's just magic. Because before that moment, is the amazing climax with Sam, Frodo, and Gollum in Mount Doom. You have uh, 
Gandalf and Pippin and Mary like cheering when Sauron blows up, but then crying when it seems clear that Frodo's definitely dead from lava. Like all the emotions and the music are just like a hundred percent. So mm-hmm. I really don't care anymore about the things that I would care about in a different context. Like if the movie wasn't paying off for me, like the emotions of a three movie journey, maybe I'd be like, oh, this is annoying. This battle scene doesn't make any sense. But it's almost like the battle scene isn't even the point anymore. We're just here for the characters and the release of it's finally over. We finally destroyed the ring. We did it. It's done. It's done. (laughs) Well, here's the thing about screenwriting at the end of the day, which is screenwriting as a kind of writing is about simplification because it is one of the shortest media that we have in terms of the way that we experience it. Any other kind of media, basically a novel length or like a a, series of epic novels as this is, you're looking at hours and hours of time and time commitment. Whereas a movie, even a very long one, needs to be condensed and simplified. And that means character arcs and themes and plot logistics as well all need to be simplified. And at the same time, the experience of watching it, the fact that we watch film with our eyes and our ears, also means that it has to keep our attention. So those are just kind of the two things that you end up dealing with when you're a screenwriter. You have to keep the attention of the audience, which means that all of these rules that and lessons that we spend our entire lives trying to like solve and figure out and learn right? About adding conflict and, you know, all of the scene design, all of the stuff that we talk about is in service to those things. It's about keeping the audience's attention and distilling very complex ideas into ultimately very simple, bite-sized, two-hour sized, or in this case, three or four hour sized, (laughs) but nonetheless, bite-sized consumable pieces of media that also have, this is the other thing about film, very low barriers for entry most of the time right? of all kinds of art that exist, right? Because you're juggling all three of those things, that just becomes your task as the screenwriter. And so when I, you know, sort of earlier, I sort of threw this term in as in a derogatory way, but like, quote unquote, movie stuff, movie stuff, quote unquote, is good (laughs) because movie stuff goes in movies. (laughs) (laughs) It's what makes movies what they are. So like everything that we're talking about that strains credulity, sure, of course it does. It's movie stuff. Like maybe it is helpful for most people for the Tower of Sauron to be a lighthouse, basically. So we know exactly that he's looking at Frodo. Like maybe Mm. we need that. Like That was a producer note, I'm sure. Like (laughs) Because I've received that note so many or like uh, the equivalent of that note. So many times I was talking to a producer today and was like about character motivations and something in one of my scripts. And he was like, it's just not clear yet. You have to write a line about it. And I'm like, it's clear to me. And he's like, no, it isn't, though, because if it isn't, it has to be there in the text on the page. It has to be a symbol you can point to. It has to be a character line of dialogue or a moment. It has to be in the actor's performances, but before it can be in the performances, it has to be on the page. So all of this stuff that Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens and Peter Jackson are doing to movify the Lord of the Rings book series, ultimately, this is what you want. Like, I'm not saying that it's not possible to make bad adaptation decisions. Stay tuned for our Hobbit episode. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that... (laughs) If you understand the reasons behind them, which, you know, in this case, all really line up and make a ton of sense. We talked in the last episode about, or I think it was in the first episode, about Aragorn's not wanting to be king so he can have an arc. You have to change it because otherwise Aragorn doesn't have an arc. If he wants to be king at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring and he still wants to be king at the end, no one cares. Right. We're here for the movie stuff. We want the arc. And so that is the right decision because it is giving us the thing that we go see movies for. Absolutely. And and so I think a thing that was striking for me about the movie experience this time for Return of the King is, as we alluded to earlier, it's always kind of fun to make fun of 
all the endings that this movie has. And I, I remember being in the theater and kind of checking my watch of like, okay, but like, is it really over yet? Because like, I have my popcorn ready, like I'm ready to leave the theater, like what's happening? <laughs> uh, so I was definitely one of the people that was like, didn't need all the endings. I was so mad at you people in the theater when I saw this movie because I was like crying and like emotional and like so with it and people were like t- taking their phones out. I was so mad. Just FYI. Word. But upon revisiting them, you know, these movies years later, they did not feel extraneous this time for me and felt like they were delivering all those things that you're you were talking about, Trisha, like delivering those ends of arcs, those like confirmations mm. of change. And I think my favorite moment of this movie is when everyone kneels to the hobbits when mm-hmm. Aragorn is like, yeah, like that's legitimately made me cry. And like I felt the the thematic power of that in a way that I don't think I clicked for me, you know, in 2003 when it came out. So that was just an interesting observation that I had that I there's still maybe like one too many for me but overall I felt that these were all necessary to resolve uh, the arcs and the themes that had been established in these films mm-hmm. yeah it's it's interesting because I'd never it never occurred to me to like refer to the end of the movie as multiple endings even though like I get that that's how people say it I'm like well just because it's a post climax scene doesn't mean it's an ending but then what's interesting and the reason people say that is because there is a sort of cinematic language about what something means. So once the ring is destroyed and Sam and Frodo are outside, you know, you you fade to black for a good five seconds or maybe even 10 seconds. And like the cinematic language is telling you we could roll credits right now. And uh-huh. the the dramatic question has been answered, even if you don't necessarily know what happens next. And then at that point, there's 40 minutes of movie left or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then of course you do get the, uh, after my friends, you bow to no one, the camera pulls out, you know, and you sort of fade. So the map they are, of Middle Earth. Yeah. right. They are using the sort of cinematic language of this is how movies end in a gotcha kind of way, which can be annoying. If you, it's annoying if you're in a the theater watching a three hour movie, but if you are watching an 11 hour movie to me, it feels like 30 minutes of wrap up feels perfectly normal, you know? Sure. And I think that it's the same thing we talked about with two towers, like the depending on what has led up to where you are, how does that make you feel? You know, Alex, you said you watched the, the extended one disc a night. So that means the night you watched disc six, you're, half of what you're watching is <laughs> endings, you know, and is like, is that weird? It's like a good series finale. Right. Like, like, what do you want from your series finale? You want to like gradually say goodbye emotionally to all your favorite characters. You don't want it just to end suddenly. That's yeah. like, that's never fun. There are a lot of series where like the penultimate episode is where the big thing happens. And then the yeah. final episode is like, well, now where are we? Where does everyone go? They actually filmed endings for Legolas and Gimli too. And then just decided, all right, we got to call it somewhere. So yeah. (laughs) So even the extended cuts have restraint because there is more footage that they could have used. So yeah, for me, I love it because I'm like, I want to keep watching these movies. I'm happy to just keep seeing where people are and that kind of thing. But it just, it is interesting to, um, to use that sort of cinematic language of what an ending is to kind of mess with your expectations a little bit. And ultimately, I love that the ending, I remember walking out of the theater, my friend, former friend, oh. not just for this reason, but he was like, oh, why'd they close on a, on a door? You have all these big epic endings and you close on it on the door. Like, first of all, <laughs> read the book. Second of all, like how lovely to close, you know, you right. open the last minute mm-hmm. decision was to open with the Smeagol story. That wasn't how this movie was supposed to open at all, but they had it filmed for two towers. They didn't know what to do with it. You open on this like worm on a hook, you know, and, and looking at it and then you go into all of Return of the King and you close on like Sam and his family going into their door. You know, I love the, that it's bookended by such simplicity. The endings for me, I mean, they work especially well when you do a marathon viewing like like I've done in theaters where you watch all three movies in one mm-hmm. day. Then it totally feels appropriate for it to take a half hour to wrap everything up because you've just watched 11 hours or whatnot. For me, even just watching it in the context of Return of the King, there was something really special and beautiful about the just the feeling of the endings like it's very gentle like there's something about Mm -hmm. there's there's this softness to the way the scenes kind of start to flow into each other they're back in the shire frodo's kind of 
in this post-war state of not really knowing where he belongs anymore. And there's, it's the whole movie, especially in the theatrical cut is very, it's very fast paced and it's building to these big epic battles and it's goes pretty crazy by the end. And there's something almost like it's a different type of movie or a more artsy dramatic film in these, in this final act. And I really like it. Like I, I kind of sink into it and like soak it in, in this different way that allows for me to have a really cathartic uh, cry generally at the gray havens. Like I think if it just like tried to rush into the gray havens or rush into, Oh, we're all so sad. We're saying goodbye to each other. If I wouldn't have the experience that I have with that ending. So, so I, I think there's actually a brilliance to the way the movie kind of like gently eases you into this, goodbye of, of, with all the characters that mm-hmm. makes it really special in a way that I think a more traditional let's wrap it up people like rings gone let's get out of here it, I would not have been given the same emotional catharsis that I think I got from this movie right I really love what you're talking about Alex I think the thing that really moves me about it is that the film allows there to be a cost to all of this yes it dwells on the consequences of what has happened, particularly in Frodo's life. You know, we talked about this clash of values that is sort of at the thematic heart of these movies, this like value of like power and war and, you know, riches and gold and like, and I think that's why the moment with the hobbits feels the way that it does when everyone kneels before them, where it's this one sort of expression of power kneeling down to this other set of values that the hobbits embody, right? Yes. This this loving care and the community that they have at the Shire. It's so beautiful, the contrast that's set up in that moment. But the thing is, we remember, and so does Frodo, that that was not where he aligned himself at the very end when it really came down to it. Because as you said, Frodo falls to the ring. And I think that the cost of that decision in Frodo's life, which is that when it really mattered and he had the chance to drop it, he fell to this sort of dark or evil power that, you know, had taken hold of him. Because what the ring does is it tempts the bearer of it into this, like, yeah, lust for power um, and to, like, become, you know, to rule, essentially, right? It's the one ring to rule them all. It's that, it's that power to rule. and so. Frodo remembers that he fell to that. And it is only by like the grace of Sam and luck, essentially. And and sparing Gollum's life as Gandalf hints in the first movie, you know, don't be so quick to deal with death and judgment. We don't know what's going to happen. If not for Gollum, the ring wouldn't have been destroyed. Right. Uh, Which I think is a great also kind of parable for, you know, don't be so quick to just think you should execute this person for being evil, they might accidentally do the best thing that could possibly happen. I mean, totally. There's there's a really rich conversation you could have about that. Um, I'm sure many books have been written about it. But because Frodo makes that darkest of all choices right there at the climax, and, and for that reason isn't really our hero, even though he does manage to get out of it alive, he escapes with his life. But he ultimately, you know, his soul is kind of broken because of that decision. And I think that sitting in the cost of that at the end of the movie is worth doing themat for thematic reasons is isn't just that even though the world has realigned itself and the world has sort of knelt down to this like way of being that the hobbits embody there was still this moment of that you know where the good lost the good guys lost and yeah. at least in Frodo's life. And there is a cost and a consequence to that, um, that Frodo ends up having to, you know, grapple with as he then makes the choice to like go to the gray Havens. Cause he isn't the same person he was. He in some ways isn't alive anymore. Right. He, or he right. just feels lost because of that. Well, it's embodied by the wound that never healed from you know, the witch King. Exactly. Right. And, and also I think you know, there's a lot of, you know, I think Tolkien was a war vet and there's a lot of parallels drawn to like kind of PTSD and just mm-hmm. essentially there is a brokenness to Frodo just from the trauma of having to bear the ring the whole way. You know, not just even the final decision, but just the whole experience 
was traumatic for him. And yeah, and I and I think there's something so beautiful about when he does board the elven ship that's going to go off to essentially heaven, you know, the undying lands. Yeah. When he turns around, once he's gotten on that ship, he's kind of healed or there, there's the, the last image you see of Frodo, the color has returned to his cheeks and he and he smiles in a way that he doesn't smile for like the whole ending of the movie. Mm. Uh, so there's I, I don't know what you want to read into that or what that kind of means, but there's something really bittersweet about that final scene with him getting onto that ship where it's like he can't like he's not going to be able to go on in this life but kind of as he goes off to heaven or whatever this means we get to see you know the pure frodo one last time kind of unbroken from his journey we get to see that smile and his like rosy cheeks from fellowship yeah, or or the promise that there might be healing or peace on the other side of it. Right. Right. There yeah. just isn't right now here for him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's one of my probably biggest things that I love about this series and this approach to a hero's story is that there's you know, there's never a guarantee of success and there's never a promise of return and there are losses along the way. And they as you're saying, Trisha, like really make you feel that after they come back. And and I think that's, as you were saying, Brian, I think some of the, the film language around what you expect when you sit down to watch a movie, you know, I think that it's kind of what makes those endings feel like, but wait, are, is it not done? Is it not done? Because it's not signaling to you there's, there's more story to tell. But once you get into it, I think that is, you know, the shot of the hobbits sitting at, you know, at the tavern at the... Mm where they're having their drinks and everybody else is just like having lots of fun and all this stuff. But there's like, a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there's like the things the hobbits care about seem so small right. compared right. to what they've been through. That strikes me as an honest telling of like a hero's journey. Like yes. not just, you know, there's only bravery if there is fear and there are plenty of things to be afraid of in this world. And there are costs, but like that's, I don't know. That's what's inspiring. And I think that's why it's so meaningful in the end is, is those sacrifices. So I, I do really love that they spend time to really let that sink in and give Frodo that that ending, because I think that is where a lot of the power of this tale comes from for me. Well, why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Alex, do you want to start us off? Sure. My lesson is an editor lesson. So I watched the extended cuts of all three movies over the holidays, and I just rewatched the theatrical cut of Return of the King last night. And when I watched the extended editions over the holidays, as I mentioned in our Fellowship episode, I think Fellowship extended edition actually felt better to me than the the theatrical. Like adding in those scenes created a pace and a flow and just a flushed out the characters in a way that really added to the movie for me and made it feel more complete. And I felt the opposite with Return of the King, where it felt, you know, the lesson for me was adding is not always good. Like sometimes subtraction is addition. Mm -hmm. And I think when I watched the theatrical cut of Return of the King with a lot of things subtracted, it suddenly gelled into the movie I remembered really loving in theaters. And so it just reminded me that you know, oftentimes if if you take out rough patches and things are just kind of off or awkward or just aren't quite working, it elevates everything else around it in a way that is kind of the more than the sum of its parts. And and you know, there's things in the extended edition that particularly like are oddball to me about Return of the King. Like there's like a popcorn skull like avalanche scene where <laughs> <laughs> Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas have to like run away from like a gigantic avalanche of skulls in mm-hmm. the cave of the dead and only to like in the next moment dead guy comes out and is like all right cool we will go with you to <laughs> yeah for the battle so there's there's things like that that are just like so they're not adding anything honestly to the story they're just a thing that they also did and shot and I realized that I, I actually liked the movie less with all those pieces kind of sprinkled in because it took away from this momentum and this excitement and just this kind of like a, the cleanliness of the theatrical cut where it just everything just feels really smooth. 
except for the occasional thing like marshmallow orc, which is just, you know, <laughs> that's just what it is. Mm-hmm. So so my my lesson overall is a theatrical cut of a movie is oftentimes my favorite, oftentimes my favorite, not because I don't necessarily like things that are added in a, in a director's cut. Like those individual scenes might be nice, but there's a there's a cumulative effect of a edit. And I think longer is not always better. And I think it's interesting when a lot of film fans are always really hardcore about director's cuts or extended editions, obviously, obviously being the better cut. And I think, no, I don't think that's the case. I think on a case by case, <laughs> I, I, think, I think sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. But I think oftentimes removing things is additive. That is adding something when it creates a different flow and a different experience of the overall film. Mm. Yeah, for for me, I love the death of Saruman scene, and I feel like that right. has to be in there somewhere. So if I can only get it by watching extended, I will. It doesn't add anything, but I love the mouth of Sauron scene. You know, yeah, I right. mean, just it's so freaking weird and just like it, that, it's it's kind of like old school Peter Jackson right. eyeball, yeah. the, the, the performance of the mouth of Sauron. Yeah. You would have thought one who could so small could endure so <laughs> much pain. And he did. Yeah. Kind of, He's got kind of like a Kiwi or like Australian accent. Going well, on. It's, yeah. it's Bruce yeah. Spence yeah. from uh, from Mad Max, like the, the, right. the gyrocopter oh, nice, operator, nice. you know, the, the train guy <laughs> from the Matrix, whichever. Uh Yeah, revolutions. Yeah, but even Peter Jackson was like, this scene doesn't really add anything, but we're going to put it in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, but but I agree. I feel I I probably will just, I I would be interested to watch the theatrical again, but I'm probably just, the extendeds are going to be my go-to. But for me, watching the first two movies extended, I never feel bored for like a second. I never feel like fatigued or anything. And then Return of the King, I do start to kind of get that sense a couple mm. hours in where I'm like, I kind of wish we were getting to the to the next part sooner. If I was able to A, B it and just watch them side by side without having just watched the other one, I almost certainly would probably say I think theatrical is better, even if I personally am like perfectly happy to to watch the extended, even if it does mean I'm going to need a need some caffeine halfway through or something yeah i mean i think the best cuts would be the alex cuts which you know maybe i'll just have to do <laughs> some right yeah, exactly because yeah. I, I know what's best from the extended to put in <laughs> speaking of fan cuts <laughs> of movies stay tuned for our hobbit episode <laughs> <laughs> well and I, I think yeah that it also brings up this idea of who is your audience and knowing your audience and right. like right for me starting with fellowship normal theatrical is what got me hooked in enough to then be like, well, yes, I will sit through a longer version of this movie because mm. now I am invested in right. it. And so I, I think it's cool that there can also be things like this where both exist. Right. right. You can choose. And one day we will have the Alex authoritative cut <laughs> yeah. and we can all, all agree is the final cut of these movies. <laughs> Brian, what's your lesson? Uh, so my lesson is actually about Marion Pippin. Which, Alex, you touched on earlier how they get to sort of be their own characters in this movie. You know, in, right. in Fellowship, they're the two guys in the back seat of this four person hobbit troop. And then in Two Towers, they are kind of a two headed character almost. Right. Like the casual fan, if you ask them after Two Towers to tell me the difference between Mary and Pippin, they'd be like, one guy yells at trees more than the other. Like, I don't, you know, that's about it. <laughs> one guy's more Scottish. But yeah, in this movie, you get this lovely emotion from them being separated and then reunited yeah. which which is lovely but then also each character has their own thing to deal with in this movie and they actually get their own focus uh which is really cool now the universal lesson of that is not if you're making a trilogy separate to your characters in the, the last part but i think there is a sense of if you have two characters in your script that kind of blend together First of all, should they be two characters? Because if not, you know, you might want to think about it. Right. But if you do need to be two characters, if you love these characters, then give them something to do. Show me how they're unique. You know, give them each uh, a separate problem to deal with. Even if they are joined at the hip, give them, oh, this is the guy who cares about this thing. This is the guy who cares about this thing. And I think that it's just, it's really nice to see a very epic version of how that can work in a movie. Well, and I love what you were pointing out, Alex, about Pippin, which is that he and Gandalf have a little mini arc where Mm -hmm. in their relationship and Pippin is there to basically antagonize and frustrate Gandalf. And then by the end, I love it when Pippin, you know, climbs up and lights the beacons Mm -hmm. and does something right. You know, it's just the tiniest thing where it's like Pippin's doing the wrong thing. Pippin's messing it up. And then Pippin gets the chance to do something right. 
And I know that that's, again, that's a change from the book and it's the right one. Mm -hmm. Like, because it creates this wonderful sort of richness to Pippin's character where he's made so many mistakes. He's so silly and he acts so impulsively, um, which is a lovely character to always put in a scene where it's like you have somebody that's going to act impulsively. It's just a fun counterpoint to all these more serious thought out sort of decision makers that we are used to seeing in the, tr in the trilogy. But um, yeah, it gives, it gives them an arc and like, you know, sort of Mary ends up having his own arc about, you know, becoming worthy, like wanting to be a part of the battle. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Trisha, what's your lesson? Yeah, this uh, actually is part of my lesson, which is, you know, earlier I was talking about movie stuff. Good. Mm -hmm. And generally I do feel that way. Counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> or just other side of the coin, which is movie stuff good, but you have to disguise it well. And I feel like these movies are great at doing that in all of the ways we've described. Giving characters arcs where there weren't any and streamlining plot things that were otherwise too complicated. All of those things are wins. They tried to do some movie stuff with these elves, though, that does not. They didn't quite hide it, I think, as well as they could. So the Arwen stuff becomes like a movie problem, in my opinion, in the this last chapter. Like the Arwen stuff is kind of whatever throughout. But as long as she's, you know, in Two Towers, she's like, am I going to leave Middle Earth? Yes, I am. No, I've decided not to. I'm going to stay because of Aragorn. You're kind of like, OK, that's a clear motivation. I have some questions about how elves work telepathically, but it's still like we are giving her a decision to make that gives her something to do. And that is movie stuff. Good. Generally speaking, I think in this chapter, though, they start to try to tie different stakes into this relationship that don't need to be there and don't belong there. So you have Elrond that shows up and is like, Arwen is dying because of the <laughs> ring. Surprise. Well, why? Which again, why? Um, and <laughs> Alex, I was going to say every time I watch every time I watch this movie, I try to decipher like what like what words are they actually saying and what could they mean. So it's like <laughs> what could they possibly? We, so we mean? see. So Arwen has a prophecy of she's going to have a son with Aragorn. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. So like that's a reason to stay. Like there's there's a future here besides like getting old and dying after Aragorn dies. Right. Um, so cool. I'm with you. So she's going to stay. But then she like drops a book and he's like, oh my God, you're cold. <laughs> the light of the Eldar are leaving you. So is this like, was there like a ticking time bomb since Fellowship since she gave him the necklace of like a certain point, like she's going to become officially mortal and they get just like dropped like her immortality just went away and now she can't get on the boat. But if she had gotten to the boat like two days earlier, she could have gotten on the boat. So it, that's where I, it starts to lose me. I'm like, wait, are there rules about like when you start to lose your mortality? Is she dying imminently? Not in the movie, there are not. So yeah. here's that Don't try to understand it. Just feel it. <laughs> when he says she's dying, is he just being really dramatic? Like, does he just mean she's gonna die like in a hundred years when her like mortality happens like <laughs> i have all the same questions you have alex and we are not provided with the answers right. why would why would arwen's fate be tied to the fate of the ring her specifically why 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 like i mean everybody's is in like a in a theoretical way like if soren wins we all die i guess but that's not what he's sure, saying right, yeah. yeah no it's not so she's just an elf like swooning on a couch over there <laughs> like i don't know why she particularly would die more quickly than the rest of us if sauron wins but anyway so this is what i'm saying they're trying to do movie stuff but there's no scaffolding underneath of it right, right? there's no like when you're adding character stuff to add character conflict or to raise the stakes and it's built out in a textual way. Yes, good. Do that. When you don't build it out and you try to slap it on the surface where you just have Elrond show up and try to do it in dialogue, but it hasn't been there the entire time, then no, that doesn't work. That's kind of, yeah, that's like the producer note that came in at, you know, the, the 11th hour and you were just like, I don't, you say it, Elrond. Mm. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. Um, and so it does make me wonder, like, 
you know, what were the like sort of motivations behind some of those choices, particularly with Arwen? Because I know that, you know, a lot of the reasons that we only hear hear her voice or like some stuff that's like, this is a flashback was changed because they had shot it in a different way. And then it no longer made sense when they were editing it and they were trying to figure it out and fix it in the, in fix it in post essentially, or in the edit. So I get that you, you know, you get into these corners and I'm sympathetic to that. I just think that of all of the things that this movie does incredibly well, the Arwen plot line is not the best. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so if you, yeah, movie stuff, good, but make sure you actually do it from the ground up. Don't just try to add it later. Right. I I think there's also a mini lesson here about adaptation in general, which is, you know, you always get a movie where it takes an idea and just sort of hopes that you will do the research later to figure out what it means kind of thing, you know? So you get like some book bro trying to, or explain to you that like, well, if you had read, (laughs) The Silmarillion, you would know that elves are da da da. It's like, no, no, no. If you're making a movie, give me all the right. information I need in this movie. If that means you totally get rid of a character, if that means you totally get rid of a plot line, that's fine. But don't give me stuff that is not actually supported by the text that you have given me in the movie that's in front of me. Right. Exactly my point. And I feel like Lord of Rings is, is a hard, like, it's hard. So oh, yeah. Like I, yeah. They did not have an easy task in trying to make Arwen's story relevant to the main plot because right. you know, no. she's she's barely even in the books at all. So right. to, to try to make her feel central is like a maybe impossible challenge. And I know that the romance between Eowyn and Faramir is from the books and okay. Like, <laughs> there's just, again, there's not enough time for it. Everybody, everybody's got to get paired up at the end. You know, we got to have every, all the- There's not enough time for it. Look, they're both kind of reddish blonde and they're very pretty. They have- Good faces. Like, <laughs> sure. They understand each other. They're they're related they're to They're pretty. Kings. No, no, they, they, there's like they come, kind of come from the same world. There's like a Rohan Gondor thing going on. Yeah, I like I like it. It's just there's not a there's not a lot to support it in the text. Right. Cause they just literally just met. They woke up to they almost died almost <laughs> at the same time. I get it. You you fall in love when you both almost die for at the same time. Sure. <laughs> this great moment in the theater where uh my my friend Danielle, who's a huge fan of the books, in the theatrical cut, obviously, because we're seeing it in the theater, during the coronation of Aragorn, Faramir and Eowyn are just standing next to each other and just kind of smile at each other. And she just cracked up, like <laughs> like loud in the theater, you know? And afterwards, I was like, what What was that? Like, you just like laughed loudly. And she goes, that was the only indication that these two characters end up together. There's like a whole thing, you know, the extended obviously does that work. But the theatrical, it's like they just make eye contact. And she's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, because it's not really important at all to the story no but it's just so funny that like if you have read the books you're going well that's (laughs) that two seconds of screen time is all the that's all you get yeah but but that's another good example of maybe they realized that you know they couldn't really do it from the ground up sure so cut a lot of it out and just kind of do it with a very very light touch right at the end yeah because otherwise it does kind of feel just rushed and and you know shoved in there and especially like in the theatrical cuts, like we talked about in the two towers, you kind of only sort of even know who Faramir is. Uh-huh. And he's like a jerk right. and then he's dead, but then he's not dead, but then he's going to get burned. But his dad doesn't believe like, I mean, that's a whole other literary thing. Like the whole story is very like dramatic, like Shakespearean, almost like totally. I'm gonna, yeah. We're, we're going to burn alive. But he, I think he's dead. I'm really committed to thinking Faramir is dead. Like the heathen kings of old. <laughs> Like Denethor is so committed to like believing his son is dead when his son is like clearly like moving. Mm-hmm. It's just like it doesn't work on screen so well. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't get to Denethor, John Noble. Oh, John Noble! It's, it's a great performance. Yeah, so what a just, great eater. Yeah, couldn't get there. He ch- he really is. It's one of the one of the performances in the trilogy that feel it's a kind of operating on this different level, like this kind of theatrical Shakespearean of yeah, yeah, level. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which always felt like a little bit of a mismatch. Like, like he's great at it, and I think it maybe it makes sense for the Shakespearean kind of wackiness of his story, but it right. feels a little bit odd to like cut from that to something else that is more traditional. Yeah, but yeah, it is what it is. Hey, Matt, have you ever had your son's horn washed up on shore, cloven in twain? You don't know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what any of that means. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what's your lesson? Uh, well, so honestly, we we kind of talked about already, um, even just now in lessons, the the writing lesson, which 
Alex, you brought up and Brian, you reiterated just the pairing of the characters in yeah. throughout this whole saga, I think, is really compelling. And I think that is one of the challenges when doing um, sequels. And these aren't, you know, obviously aren't sequels in the same way that like the Star Wars movies are sequels. But I think a lot of the fun of sequels rides on how do you pair up your characters and are they it interesting does. enough to characters to want to be watched and i feel like as we talked about in our star wars episodes that's where some of my problems lie with with the newer films and how they divvy all that stuff up in return of the king as we said with pippin and gandalf and just everywhere that everyone ends up it's as compelling as you know the early pairings or when they were all together but it feels fresh and keeps yeah. it fun to watch so i think that's really good and i think just you know as i've been thinking back about these films and as we're talking about lessons i think there's just a, a huge wealth of filmmaking lessons to be learned and investigating sure. all of these films and it's so great as we've talked about that there are these amazing behind the scenes features and commentaries and you know these films same with you, Alex, as you've said, like were very instructional for me in developing my sense of filmmaking. And I remember even like downloading, you know, the versions of the movies and then taking little still frames of, oh, I really like that shot. Oh, that's how you frame a cool shot. Or like Sam with his, or Frodo over Sam with his sword at the end of Two Towers when he's like pointing the sword at Sam. Like that mm -hmm. shot was just like, oh, this is a shot. This is what a movie is. So I, just as we're wrapping up and talking about lessons, I feel like it's there's so much here to investigate, to figure out what you like, what you don't like, what you love about film. I feel like there's there's an endless well of things to explore. So there's a whole dragon's treasure trove of lessons. To learn. <laughs> Indeed. Wow. <laughs> Awesome. Why don't we go around and say what we've been watching? Brian, what have you been watching recently? First, before I get into it, I want to say that I did rewatch all 18 hours of the Lord of the Rings special features across the three movies wow. over the past few weeks. Wow. And I haven't watched them since like the DVDs came out. And it was such a joy. I, I spent two weeks in New Zealand in 2008 and I miss it. And just beautiful country mm -hmm. with such wonderful people. I know you were there recently too, Tricia. It's the best and I want to move there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, just the love and care that went into these movies. I got more emotional watching the features this time around than the actual movies themselves. Just seeing how how much everyone was just loving what they were doing and so committed mm -hmm. to what they were doing. So, so yeah, if you have not watched the features ever or in a long time, I highly recommend it. Speaking yeah. of emotional, what I did watch was the film Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, mm. which is written and directed by Eliza Hittman, and it stars Sidney Flanagan and Talia Ryder. It's a drama about a 17-year-old girl in suburban Pennsylvania who finds out she's pregnant. She has to figure out how to deal with that information. It's an exceptionally well-made film. It's kind of presented in this hyper-realist slice-of-life kind of way, which I'm normally not a huge fan of, but... It also does, speaking of like less is more and like hiding movie stuff, like it mm -hmm. it shows how so much can be said with so little information actually being stated out loud. The, the movie sets up sort of mysteries, about, not mysteries, but it sets up questions about what exactly is going on with the character. And instead of sort of always saying it in text, the movie says it in emotional reaction and in little things that it shows you. And there's a scene. It, 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 the sort of central point of this movie i don't know if it's the midpoint but it's sort of like the the scene in this movie that the whole movie is sort of builds around that it, it's incredibly understated but watching that scene hit me so hard emotionally like i went back and watched it the next day and i it, it still crushed me the second time and 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 just yeah how much you can do with with so little um but still saying so much it's contender movie for the year for me never rarely sometimes always check it out wow Awesome. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things. Awesome. Cool. Alex, what about you? So I watched a, a feature length documentary on YouTube called Raising Kratos, a documentary about the making of the 2018 PlayStation game God of War. Ooh. And I wasn't expecting it to be a great documentary. I thought it was maybe just, okay, PlayStation decided to fund and put out a feature length documentary about their big flagship game and it'll be kind of promotional or something but it was actually a legitimate documentary it was really well done and really got into the nitty-gritty of what goes into making a triple a huge video game and it didn't even get into like the technical aspects as much as the 
kind of emotional toll it takes on the game director and all mm. the employees that are just slaving away trying to make this impossibly complicated crazy thing for years and years and years and years you know you go through all the way to they kind of announce it at e3 and have their first like demo and they're all terrified that the fans of this series will just think it's dumb what they're doing with the game and so they're like on the edge of their seats waiting to see the fan reaction and when the fans react like super positively like they're all like crying and like having an emotional reaction to it so it, you're with them and i was actually getting really emotionally affected mm. because it it reminds you of the process of creation of like making mm -hmm. a movie or video game or whatever it's such a journey you put so much into it most of it you're just like solving problems and like feeling like it's never going to be finished and it's such a desperate like impossible task and then there's such a catharsis when it it does work and the miracle does come together and it is released people like it so it, it takes you through that whole journey and so even if you're not a video game person it's just a good documentary about what it's like to to make a lord of the rings or make something yeah. that is huge and epic and maybe not even a good idea because it's so ambitious but when you pull it off it's like the best thing in the world so if you if you want that kind of a behind the scenes documentary i really recommend it raising kratos it's free on youtube awesome cool trisha what have you been watching I was on our Discord and a couple of our patrons were chit-chatting about a, well, they were chit-chatting about Vim Vendors and they brought up a Vim Vendors movie from 1977 that was an adaptation of one of Patricia Highsmith's Ripley novels. Mm. And I'm a massive fan of Patricia Highsmith's Ripley novels, the first one being The Talented Mr. Ripley. She wrote four others um, about that same character, Tom Ripley. And I thought I had seen every adaptation of every Ripley book <laughs> that's ever been made, but I was wrong because I had missed this very important Vim Vendors one, um, which is called The American Friend. And like I said, from 1977, it stars Dennis Hopper and Bruno Ganz and Lisa Cruiser, who is a total babe. And Alex, your best friend from Dark, she plays Claudia in Dark. Oh, wow. the, the older Claudia. Yeah, she's amazing in this. Anyway, everybody is amazing in it. Dennis Hopper is as insane as you could ever <laughs> hope for him to be. He's such an odd choice. Like, he's not who you would think of to play this character. I feel like most people... So different people have played Tom Ripley over the years, most famously Matt Damon. But also John Malkovich has mm -hmm. played Tom Ripley. Ripley's game, same book that this is based on. It's the same book. Yeah, yeah, this is based on Ripley's game as well. So yeah, John Malkovich played the character in Ripley's game, an adaptation of it. And this is just the weirdest, but kind of coolest version. <laughs> I don't know. It's incredibly gorgeous, this movie. Like every single shot in it is so ridiculously beautiful. The use of light and color is so rich. Dennis Hopper is so oddly possessed. The movie is messing with, it's like a crime thriller as all the Ripley books are, but the movie is messing with your ideas about like crime thrillers where there's all these tiny little scenes that don't seem to fit into anything, which is not what we expect crime thrillers to be. And it's a very poignant story Ripley's game is about. Basically, Ripley makes a bet that he can get anybody to commit a murder. And so he talks this local He's a framer. And by that, I mean like a picture framer. Mm -hmm. He talks a picture framer in his town um, into committing murder. And the way that he does it is because this picture framer that he knows has a deadly illness that is is killing him very slowly. And so he's like, hey, do this murder. You'll make all this money. And then you, it'll, you take care of your family when you're gone. And so it's this really tragic sort of like moving towards, you know, the inevitable death of this person, you know, who has a fatal disease. And Ripley's kind of like in there and it interrogates like their friendship. And like, it's really weird and really, <laughs> really good. Like, basically, as I was watching it, I was having the experience of like every scene. I'm like, I love this movie. <laughs> like, I, I love this movie. Do more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To keep going, movie. You're awesome. Like, I just. <laughs> Really enjoyed it. So anyway, that's the American friend. And thanks to our patrons on Discord for recommending it to me. I can't believe it had been a hole in my Ripley filmography up until this point. That's great. So two things I'm going to mention. I want to mention quickly, Trisha, because you've mentioned it before and what you're watching. Uh, Memories of a Murder, the Bong so Joon-ho movie. Mm -hmm. I finally watched and it is so good. I really, really enjoyed it. It was very fascinating to see 
early Bong Joon Ho mm-hmm. and how he evolved. I kind of went on a Bong Joon Ho journey, uh, which I'll talk more about in future episodes. But I watched Memories of a Murder, very much liked it. Uh, but more recently, what I've been constantly watching is The Crown. Uh, and as this new season <laughs> came out, I was like, well, I think it's time for me to go and back and start and see if I get into it. And I got sucked in super duper oh, hard. Yeah. And it's just so good. So good. It's just I love so the crown. Good. And like, it's just so good because <laughs> like, in a way that very few things are where like yeah. the, the entire package of what you are being given is full of goodness. The cinematography, the acting, the writing, just all of it is just dialed in so nicely. And like the worst episode of this show was like the best episode of anything else. And so I, I've become just obsessed with it. And there are a couple of really standout episodes that I'm have give me that thing of how did you people do this? This is too good. How did you make a good this good? So I've been very, very much mm-hmm. enjoying The Crown and, and just finished this season. And I'm now sad that I have to wait for the new seasons to come. Welcome I mean, to- Jillian Anderson like yeah, she's yes. Jillian Unreal. Anderson <laughs> like in a room with Olivia Coleman like yeah. doing it yeah, what else do you want <laughs> yeah it's so we should talk about this more <laughs> uh, is all I'm saying I would certainly be down I have many things to say about how good this show is <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you got on board yeah so you're saying it's good great. uh it's okay okay <clears throat> yeah <laughs> Awesome. This has been our conversation about The Return of the King. A reminder that our patron exclusive episode on The Hobbit is available today. So head to our Patreon and sign up and hear our thoughts on The Hobbit. We also do on our Patreon live Q&As every month. And there is a monthly film club chat. And so this February 6th, we'll be getting on a Zoom call with a bunch of patrons and chatting more about Lord of the Rings and getting to hear what all of you guys have to say about it. So we're very excited about that. Thank you to the patrons, as always, for making this show possible. Mm -hmm. Beyond the Screenplay is produced by Vince Major. Our editor is Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Calleros. As always, our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet. Say hi. If you enjoy the podcast, tell a friend about it. It's a great way to help us grow the podcast and get to know more awesome people. And we will see you in our next episode for a conversation about hidden figures. Until then. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.